Greetings, folks. I think this is going to be a really cool video, and I'm going to bring a few things new to the table that perhaps you haven't seen or thought of before. While simultaneously talking about the G15 and G14, doing a little basic overview and comparison. Of course, we're leaving out some of the small stuff in there, but just some of the bigger components to talk about that, some updates on the product itself, and a few comparisons with a few props. It's going to be very hands-on. It's going to be a lot of fun. So for starters, here are the basic specs of the G15 and G14. And so looking at my cheat sheet here, we have the G15 at 15 inches, the G14 at 13 inches. Now, a lot of people are very excited about that form factor. And this is probably, it most definitely, right, the most powerful laptop we've ever seen with the specs that you can get inside for its form factor. And those that were wondering just how small that is, let me introduce to you my first prop. This is my wife's 2015 MacBook Air. Now, the G14 has a 12.8 inch width and this is 12.75. Now the G14 is a quarter of an inch more shallow. It has a little bit less depth, but when we compare this to let's say a Mag 15, like so, it is a little bit smaller. So you can just see the edge of the Mag 15 here. So add a quarter inch to that, and we do have maybe just an inch or a little bit more over here as well. So there is a size difference and to some that could be quite substantial. The reason why I use the Mag 15 besides for another purpose that we have coming up shortly is that it has a very shallow depth just like the razor blade does and it's becoming the more traditional smaller thinner 15 inch laptop versus this classic style arrow which has quite a bit more depth and when you put a 13 inch macbook or 13 inch g14 you can see just how much more depth we have on that particular build and it was just by design and the newer Arrow, I do believe, follows a very similar form factor. But whereas the Mag 15, the Max Lime, the Razor Blades, those are a lot more shallow and quite a bit more comparable to a G14 for a 15 inch laptop, if that makes sense. So moving forward onto the CPU. Now the G14 has the 4900, the G15 has the 4800. In the real world, there isn't much of a difference. Have you ever heard of chip binning before? This is more of a binned CPU. Pretty cool. Now, if we were able to get the exact same laptop, spec for spec, pound for pound, but that CPU was an option for an additional 50 bucks, I think even over the next few months, some people still may pass on that. I have my doubts on just how much of a real world difference that is. But you know, if it was 50 bucks, I might opt for it. If it was a hundred dollar difference, definitely not. Is that CPU just amazing over the other one? No, not at all. And the difference there is likely to be very similar to what we saw with an 8750H versus a 9750H. In fact, that specific scenario might even be a little bit better from a performance standpoint. And even if it's not, the difference between the 4900 and the 4800 inside of laptops is slim to none. I do like that chip binning though. I think that's pretty cool. So the G15 does have a local area network port, whereas the G14, you will have to use a dongle if you desire connecting uh, direct with a, a LAN cable there. So if you have a Cat5 or Cat6 cable, you wanna connect it to your laptop physically, you will be unable to do so on the G14 unless you have a dongle. Now for storage, it's nice that the G15 has twice the storage capability with two M.2s versus one. That's pretty cool, but kind of to be expected on a smaller laptop, of course. The display on the G15, 240 hertz. We do know now that it is three milliseconds. Asus has a nice updated product page on this, and I will put that before you now. The uh, NTSC color gamut should ultimately get us pretty close to 100% standard RGB, and that same thing goes for the G14. It won't be quite at 100% standard RGB, but it'll probably be somewhere between maybe 94 to 98%, which is really good. Now, the display on the G14, it's my understanding that it has a pretty high response time, so if you are just you know into gaming and you can deal with the, you know, 
15 inch form factor, then I would suggest going with the G15 because that panel looks to be just what we want out of a gaming laptop. Now here's where the updated information comes into play. And I still have people even up until this morning telling me that the 2060 inside the G15 is 80 watts but according to the sources that we have now, it looks like they are going to be using the 65 watt 2060 Max-Q, the same for the G14. So what this means from a performance standpoint is that you are going to see a lower clock speed before power limit throttling kicks in. And to put that into a different perspective, let's say that GPU now is gonna perform slightly under a typical 80 watt uh, laptop 1660 Ti. So not too excited about that and if the g15 is the most premium and nice laptop that we may currently get over the next few months featuring the ryzen cpu yeah, i'm very very disappointed to find out that we're getting a gpu that underperforms the 1660 ti 80 watt variant which has been a gpu which has been power that we've been able to get in laptops for several years now and that's very disappointing to state at least now with that said, I do have some more information about that and how that will affect the temperatures of the Ryzen CPU that you're going to find super interesting, and I can't wait to share that with you in today's video. Now, when it comes to the memory, we have eight gigabytes of soldered memory on both laptops, and we have one memory slot that you can occupy with memory that you could buy elsewhere, which is nice that we can do that, but the soldered memory, while memory is not typically something that breaks down so having it soldered is not something i'm particularly worried about it's the upgrade path that people may choose to go down so just a heads up eight gigabytes soldered go with the 16 gigabyte model that means you're going to have eight gig soldered and eight gigabytes of an actual dim that you will be able to replace you want to go with that route versus eight gigabyte soldered and a 16 gigabyte dims. I know that a 24 gigabyte memory would look better on paper, but the way Windows works and the scaling and how it will just allocate all of its resources across memory, it does a really good job at that. There's gonna be some situations where some of you may go past that 16 gigabyte threshold and now your dual channel performance is going to be compromised and heaven forbid if you're in a game the performance that you are going to see would look something like this your cpu is just going to randomly hit 100 percent utilization which is going to be weird on a very powerful 16 thread ryzen mobile chip and you're going to see your gpu saturation fall along with your frame rate and when this happens there will be people that will come to me and my suggestion then after discovering that that is indeed the solution that they have 8 gig soldered, 16 um, not soldered, so 24 gigabytes, I would suggest to them to move down to 8 in 8, and Windows will kind of reconfigure how it uses its memory. You shouldn't have any issues at that point. It's a very weird recommendation, but it is something I'm positive I'm going to encounter probably over the next 6 to 18 months. So just a heads up, if you're going to go with either one of these laptops, please go with the 16 gigabyte model and not the 24 gigabyte model for the best consistent performance and I do not foresee either one of these coming with a 16 gigabyte soldered memory and then you can have an extra 16 gigabyte for 32 unless these are extremely and I mean extremely popular which maybe they will be but it's still if I had to guess I don't think we're gonna see it I'm gonna now talk about how these lower TDP GPUs are going to affect the temperature of not only the GPU that goes without saying but with the CPU as well. So let me give you prop number two here. This is a MAG-15. And on this side, we have the CPU, and on this side, we have the GPU. So there's three ways that I suggest to people to uh, sort of cure or curb temperatures on these hotter than Satan's balls Intel CPUs. Now there's more than just three, but I'm gonna share with you the three that I typically share with the community. One, undervolt, right? Use XTU or throttle stop, peel off some of that voltage. But depending on how your fan curve works and the scaling, if you can't max out your fans, you may find that those temperatures are still 
very, very high spied an undervolt. And if you go to my tutorials, you're gonna see many comments of people that have had that happen to them. You're gonna see others where they were able to peel 10 degrees Celsius off their CPU. And it has more to do with how the laptop is configured and the fan curve and the overall efficiency of the machine versus others out there that just don't have that luxury. The other solution is to replace the thermal paste. If your laptop is maybe six months old or older, 99% of the time, new thermal paste will yield better thermal performance. Now that might only be three degrees Celsius and on others, I've seen their laptops get a 20 degree improvement. Don't expect that, this is a very rare scenario. There's probably a lot of dust in their system. It was probably a year and a half old. The paste was crusty to begin with. So those rare instances, these people will get a huge thermal performance improvement with new paste. So that's number two. Number three, very interesting here. Using MSI Voltage Curve Editor, we actually peel off some of that unnecessary voltage on the GPU. And by doing so, we'll actually not only improve the thermal performance of the GPU, but because these are shared heat sinks, that heat transfer is no longer as violent as it was before, and therefore the CPU temperatures are actually a little bit cooler. Let me give you a demonstration what that looks like using the Aero 15. This is not a thermally efficient chassis by any means, and I was still able to pull this off, giving you a worst case scenario. Check this out. For this simulation, we've taken our 8750H and limited the wattage to 26 watts. This will simulate a very similar wattage that you may get with your Ryzen 4800H while gaming. The GPU is the 2070 Max-Q, and running it at 90 watts, you can see that our GPU will be in the lower 80s and CPU now will be in the low to mid 80s. Now using the MSI Voltage Curve Editor, the lowest amount of wattage that I was able to pull from the 2070 was right around that 70 to 75 watts. That was the best I could do for this simulation, but nonetheless, look how much cooler not only our GPU is, but the CPU is about 5 to 8 degrees cooler as well. I capped the frame rate to 155 FPS on both videos, and the reason I needed to do this was just to get a little bit better consistency of the 75 watts that I was trying to achieve. Ultimately, I would like to be able to peel this back to 65 to reveal something even more accurate, but I was unable to get the wattage that low on the 2070 Max-Q, even if I underclocked it. And yes, everything here was in a static environment over a long period of time for maximum heat soak. So imagine if I was able to get this GPU down to 65 watts, and now you could see just how much better it would be even from there, which is really awesome. Why do I bring this up? Because I want a better, more powerful GPU paired with Ryzen. Most of you do. Some of you are gonna be very okay with the G14, G15. In fact, incredibly happy. But the big vocal community out there right now is wanting more horsepower behind this CPU. And when that day comes and we get that 115 watt variant combined with these awesome 4000 series CPUs, you can better believe that you are going to see higher temperatures from that Ryzen 4000 CPU than you are seeing currently. That is just a fact. That is exactly how this is going to work. I'm going to be there for it. It's going to be very interesting and very entertaining to watch because at the end of the day, I don't know how much cooler these CPUs are really going to be compared to Intel when you break it down. I still anticipate a five, maybe 10 degree thermal improvement overall, which honestly is awesome. But we don't have these high performance GPUs paired with the CPU yet. And when we do, it's going to run hotter unless these cooling solutions and laptops improve and revamp their thermal efficiency. All right, folks, that's gonna do it for now. Hopefully you enjoyed this unique perspective on everything that I shared with you today. I'm Bob of All Trades, and I'll see you in the next video.